You are listening to the Wealth Formula Podcast with Buck Joffrey. Get ready to change your life. Welcome, everybody. This is Buck Joffrey with the Wealth Formula Podcast coming to you from Santa Barbara, California, a little part of Santa Barbara called Montecito, where apparently now, as uh, you may have heard, my new neighbors are Prince Harry and Meghan, and it's uh, all very exciting. I'm, I'm hoping to have them over for a barbecue soon. And I will let you know how that goes. Uh, Hey, listen, I uh, want to remind you before we get started here with today's uh, special uh, show that there is a website called wealthformula.com. Wealthformula.com is the home of the podcast that you are listening to now, Wealth Formula Podcast. And it is also a place where you can get a number of resources uh, that are not available to you simply by listening to this podcast or watching me on YouTube or whatever you're doing. And those include free books, but other than free books and free stuff, there's lots of opportunity to sign up for lists that might be of benefit to you, including the Investor Club list. Uh, this is the list where everything that we talk about suddenly becomes reality for you. In other words, it's where the magic happens. You take these concepts that you learn on this show and you they come to life in an investor club. Of course, in order to participate, you do need to be what is known as an accredited investor. Uh, I will let you look that up. But basically, uh, you either are one or you're not. It's not something that you need to apply for, but it really has to do with how much money you make, basically $200,000 a year or through... $300,000 $300,000 if you're filing jointly and or a net worth of $1 million outside of your personal residence. Uh, of course, there are some new regulations there saying that if you have some simple, uh, you know, some basic financial stuff, some degrees or certifications, et cetera, then you can be accredited as well. But you may want to look that up. We'll, we'll talk about that some other time um, in more detail. As for today's show, I will give you uh, one little bit of advice that I I believe to be true. So bottom line is, uh, if you want to be wealthy, do as the wealthy do. That's a simple concept, right? If you want to be healthy, do as the healthy do. You know, the wealthy do not use IRAs. They don't use 401ks to invest in heavy loaded mutual funds that suck away all their profits. That system as uh, you already know because you listen to this podcast, is really set up to make others wealthy, not to make you wealthy. The ultra-wealthy get a completely different set of options when it comes to investing their money. They often have direct ownership in businesses and real estate, you know, like many of us do. So we're, you know, doing that right already. They may own publicly traded equities, but they're not paying you know, the same kind of fees that most people do. The ultra wealthy also understand the importance of leverage like you do and apply it judiciously whenever possible to increase their returns. They are also keenly aware of tax efficient investment strategies. So all of these things or a lot of these things we already do, uh, you know, by uh, listening to this podcast, these are the types of things you're already thinking about already. But perhaps the biggest difference, in my opinion, Uh, between the typical retail investor and the ultra-wealthy or affluent individuals that I know is that the latter, the ultra-wealthy that is, do not simply hope for the success of their investments. They typically have some ability to engineer it, right? It's engineering something rather than just hoping for it. Now, what does that mean? Well, let me give you an example. Okay, let's take the example of permanent life insurance. This is kind of what we're going to talk about today. Dave Ramsey, Susie Orman, you know, these people who talk to the masses, they tell you to stay away from the stuff, right? Yet, if you look at it, the wealthiest families in the world, like the Rothschilds and the Romneys, right? Uh, They've used these products for generations to preserve and to build wealth. In fact, the wealthier the family, I, you know, I will stand by this. The wealthier the family, the more likely it is that they're using some kind of permanent life insurance as part of their wealth Uh, building and preservation strategy. You see, the affluent do not view permanent life insurance policies as simply assets, right? And and that's part of the whole uh, confusing thing about why there's such a dissonance between the way 
you know, different groups of people view this stuff. They use the elements of permanent life insurance uh, to enhance their other investments by manipulating those kinds of elements. So when life insurance is used properly, it is a tool to leverage your other investments, right? It's, it's, not, it's not just an investment itself. It's not just an asset. It's a tool. So again, why would Dave Ramsey and Susie Orman tell you that permanent life insurance is a bad idea? Well, a fool with a tool is still a fool, right? It's hard to become wealthy if you're a fool, or at least to maintain your wealth for a long time, but you got to know how to use those tools. And permanent life insurance is a serious, like nuclear weapon type tool. Uh, now, I've been trying to uncover these kinds of secrets of the wealthy for years now, as you know, and I've been podcasting about them. And along the way, I've learned a ton. And if you're a new listener or somebody who's recently, um, you know, just tuned in, I will tell you that there is a lot to learn. I've been trying to diligently pass this information on to you for years now, and I know there's a lot to absorb. However, I will say this, and it's a big statement, I know, but if you do nothing more with this podcast and to pay close attention to the concepts of what we cover in this episode of Wealth Formula Podcast, which are concepts known as Wealth Formula Banking and Velocity Plus. If you simply do that, you do nothing else, I believe that I will have done a big time service to you. And you'll figure out why that is when we come back from these messages. Welcome back to the show, everyone. Today, my guest on Wealth Formula Podcast, well, they are uh, very well known to most of our uh, Wealth Formula community. Um, we've got uh, Christian Allen and Rod Zabriskie, who are our Wealth Formula Banking and Velocity Plus and all these other permanent insurance tri products uh, representatives um, who help facilitate all those things and have, have uh, done business with an awful lot of you, and hopefully we'll continue to do so because believe it or not, I think that these investments uh, in permanent life insurance could be the most profitable investment you can make and the single best financial position you can take in your life and for the life of your heirs. Now, that's a big, big, big statement. So let me start with that. Christian and Rod, either one of you, agree, disagree? Tell me what uh, what do you make of that enormous comment that I just made? Yeah, well, I'll jump in. This is Christian. Uh, thanks for having us on again, Buck. We love to be here. Um, so I think the answer to your question is a pretty emphatic yes, um, especially given the economic conditions that we're in, right? So not only do we have, you know, opportunities where we can leverage these policies and really powerful, impactful ways that can create, you know, all sorts of retirement income or, or enhance our investing. The other thing it could do is just be, you know, our saving grace from market ups and downs. And so, you know, when you kind of combine all of the things that they do, um, I'm certainly biased, but I believe it's, uh, certainly one of the most impactful financial vehicles that someone can use in their, uh, in their world. Yeah. And, you know, I say that because I'm trying to, you know, I, th this topic, uh, on its surface is not particularly sexy, you know, <laughs> life insurance, you know, I mean, it doesn't sound like that sexy, but you know, but so, so I thought it was important for me to say that initially, just so that people don't tune out, because I think the risk here is tuning out too soon, because I feel like I missed out probably on a decade of value by doing this. So let's, let's turn completely I, back to basics here. Yeah, yeah, go sorry, ahead. Sorry, can I just throw one more th one thought out of there? Yeah. And I think it has a lot to do with your formula, right, with the wealth formula, because the, the policies by themselves don't necessarily give you all of that value, right? It's when you use it in conjunction with principles like cash flow right. and leverage and velocity and these, just these core principles that, that, that bring them to life and, and just make what you are and will be doing better. To let, let's go back to basics though, because since we've last had you guys on the show, 
I mean, we have so many more listeners. We have so many new, uh, you know, new members of our community and our investor club, et cetera. One of the things that we got to make sure is that we don't talk past people because for, again, for years, I remember hearing commercials on these concepts and being like, what? Bank on yourself? What does that even mean? I don't even understand what that means, right? So let's go back to basics. What are the different kinds of life insurance out there in the first place? Just, you know, thousand foot, uh, view down. Okay. I can jump in on this. So basically we want to break it down into three camps. Our camps are, well, actually let's break it down into two camps. First, we have permanent life insurance and term insurance. Mm -hmm. Term insurance is what it sounds like. I pay an insurance premium. If I die during the life of that term, then the insurance company pays a death benefit to whoever, um, that policy is assigned to go to afterwards. So you're, and, you're sort of renting insurance for a period of time with an expiration on it. Yeah, that's exactly right. Which, by the way, can be incredibly valuable and important. Sure. So we won't even diminish, not diminishing the value of it because it has a, has a super impactful role. Sure. So then we, take, we go over to the permanent insurance side and it's just designed to be in somebody's, you know, designed to be there for the rest of the person's life. Um, and in its kind of sim most simplistic form, the idea is just to make sure that if I die at, you know, 42 or 92, that insurance is in place and going to cover, going to cover me for whatever needs I have. Now that doesn't get into really what we do with it, but from a, just a purely simplistic standpoint, those are the real, the two types. And then they take a little bit of a turn and they add this couple different types of permanent insurance, which is universal life, whole life and variable universal life. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, maybe I won't break those down completely, but just a really quick difference between the three. Um, whole life is completely fixed. So we know the returns that we're getting. It, they, it's really the crediting method or the way that we earn interest in the policy that separates them. So like I say, in whole life, it's a combination of guaranteed interest rate and um, dividends. And then inside of a universal life policy, it's going to be an interest rate um, crediting method. And if that's in a variable policy, then that could just be market-based performance. And if that's in a um, fixed universal life or an index universal life, it's going to be based on a crediting method. Um, and so in our world, we traditionally use um, whole life when we're working with wealth formula banking. We'll, we can talk about some of the reasons why. And then when we get into leveraging the policies to say like massively increase retirement income, in that world, we're generally using index universal life. So, so hopefully that at least gives us a baseline. Yeah, and we're going to jump into those in more detail. But I think the 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 thing that I wanted to be, um, uh, you know, I mean, literally, if you are brand new to this idea and all you know is what I knew when I came out of residency, what people told me. You know what they used to tell so what about life insurance, guys? What should I do with life insurance? And all of the other guys in the in, in, in the practice quickly would say, the young guys especially, not the older guys notably, uh, would say, well, that's a no-brainer. Buy term and invest the difference, right? That's what they said. That's the, that's the quote, buy term and invest the difference. In other words, don't buy anything permanent. And then, of course, that is um, reinforced by well at the you know in in the general public you've got guy you know guys like Dave Ramsey or even you know Susie Orman they tell you all oh, to stay away from anything whole life related um and then of course you know there's the whole physician community like you know has got their own uh voices out there who are constantly you know dogging on these concepts right so i didn't doubt this concept of buy term and invest the difference until I noticed something. And that was that, you know, even though these young professional types were avoiding uh, the permanent side of insurance in any sort of way, you know, I, as a business guy, started noticing that my higher net worth friends um, and, and colleagues were, were actually, and, and in fact, the, the richer they were, the more involved with these things they were. And they were involved with things that were called, you know, whether they were called cash flow banking or concepts called LERPs or life insurance retirement plans. Or uh, I started hearing terms like premium finance and private placement life insurance. 
So here I am in this crossroads where, well, gosh, it, you know, Susie Orman and, and, you know, the, and Dave Ramsey and, and the, the, the position guy are all saying they shouldn't do this. And they're, they're, they're saying it's stupid advice. And all of a sudden these super rich people, they're all using these concepts. So help me understand, help us understand the, uh, appear, this dissonance between the advice that the professional class like doctors are getting and the advice that obviously the ultra wealthy are getting. And I can assure you they are not getting bad advice. So help me understand that. Help everyone understand that because that is, is, is a something that you have to get over when you start uh, going down this road, because there's this strange conventional wisdom that is frankly just BS. Yeah. So I think the the place to start is just to say that the, the way that the life insurance is used in those specific strategies, like you're talking about is exactly that it's within a strategy. So life insurance by itself, if the only thing I'm looking for is a death benefit, then that probably makes the, the conversation a little simpler. Right. But when we get into situations like people who invest in real estate and other cash flow types of investments, we're talking about people who are building a net worth to a point where they need to start worrying about uh, estate tax planning. Uh, when we're when we're you know meeting with people who like to use leverage already in a lot of ways in their life, and we can show them some really creative ways to to, to use life insurance and leverage and and just create much better uh, results in their world. Then we're just getting into a, a realm where we're saying, okay, let's just understand the tool for what it is and, and use it in the ways that we can create the, the most benefit. Right. So, uh, and part of that comes because it, it has tax, some special tax treatment uh, given to it. And that's been in existence since the income tax was created. Right. Some, you know, the, the uh, influential people at the time uh, placed a, a benefit on people who own permanent life insurance products. And so uh, generally speaking, when we put money into these policies, we're putting after tax dollars, but everything that comes back out, whether it's while I'm living or when I die, it's all going to come back out tax free. And so even that by itself opens up the door to a lot of different opportunities that, that people, if they understood even just that one fact might be a little more open to it. Uh, but then again, what's you, the motivation? More details, Rod. What's the motivation though? There's underlying. There's always a financial motivation. Like, is it just the the standard way of setting up permanent life for you know Joe Doctor? Um, is you know just a rip off, and 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 you know because they're really just trying to maximize commissions and they're not really trying to create a strategy. Is that why? It's, it, it's bad. Explain that a little bit. Yeah. Great question. And, and that's, I think that does get down to the heart of, you know, when Dave Ramsey or Susie Orman or some of these other gurus uh, speak against whole life insurance or, or any of these permanent life insurance products, uh, generally that is what they're speaking against is the vanilla form that's just put out there. Hey, you know, put money into this and you know, build a cash value and, and et cetera. Um, Whereas when we talk about it in the context of these specific strategies that the wealthy use, it's a very different conversation. We're, com we're creating a very, a very different type of policy that is maximized toward what we want, right? The living benefits, the growth of the, the cash inside of the policy and access to that cash, uh, et cetera. Again, we'll get into more details as we talk maybe about some of the specific strategies, but, but there are just things we can do with life insurance, especially when it's created and, and strategy that, uh, in conjunction with that strategy, then, uh, we can just do very different things with it. The, so yeah, go ahead. Christian. Yeah. Really, so one of the things that I think ends up happening is that when the gurus and when a lot of people are considering what they would like or not like out of life insurance, they start considering it as an, as, and comparing it to like a traditional investment. Right. And so that's, so that ends up being the first mistake, like in the ways that we use these policies, the, 
the underlying policy alone is never the is never the end all be all right we're still we have to use other things in conjunction with that to really be able to grab out all of the value and so it's not that traditional policies these vanilla policies are bad they just you know if you're comparing it and saying hey i'm expecting to get a 10 percent return inside of my vanilla life insurance policy you're not going to get that right yeah so bottom line is here's the deal this is the way i think um i think you should people should look at this as christian and rod are saying effectively the reason why uh, the reason why these things have gotten bad raps is first they're not structured uh optimally for for what we want second when when the way to use these things optimally is as a tool to enhance your investments. They are not the investment themselves. They are the they are tools to make your investments better, to supercharge them. And so let's start talking about that because that's really where we where for me the aha moment starts coming in. So um, you know, and and these concepts are not that new. I mean, I think. Even since the it was the 1980s or 90s, and Nelson Nash wrote the Infinite Banking book. Um, so there's a lot of products out there. One of the core products that we love is in what we call wealth formula banking. This is similar to the Nelson Nash concept, although this is really further optimized quite a bit. Even from that, would you? Who wants to describe that for us? Yeah, I can. Yeah, I can jump on that. So uh, wealth formula banking. Uh, as you said, originally uh, Nelson Nash called it infinite banking. Uh, there are other terms for it: uh, cash flow investing or cash flow banking. Um, and in other contexts, we call it the investment optimizer. So anyway, it, it's the idea behind an, an infinite banking is that we're building up cash value inside of our whole life insurance policy. We're getting the tax benefits that we talked about. Uh, we're getting a very consistent growth on that uh, on that cash, and we have access to it in the form of a loan. So again, if you're new to this concept, I'm gonna I'm gonna do my best to to in, in kind of this brief context explain it. But uh, you can learn more and go to the wealthformulabanking.com website, and we have a a really in depth webinar there that you can take a look at. But the idea is that when we access that cash. And because we're able to do it in the form of a loan, then we have that cash. We're going to go out and use it in in this context. We're using it for investing real estate, businesses, notes, whatever that might be, some sort of cash flow investing. And, uh, but because we use, we, we access that money in the form of a loan, our underlying account value stays there and continues to grow on this path of, of earning the guaranteed interest plus the dividend and so we're quite literally creating value in two places at the same time. And so maybe to add some context between what the traditional infinite banking concept is doing versus what we're talking about here is you, you probably hear people talk about infinite banking and in a lot of different ways, right? Hey, go buy all of your cars through infinite banking, uh, use it to finance your trips, uh, et cetera, right? Which, which is fine. You can do all of those things. Uh, the way that we talk about it, though, is we are hyper focused on using it in conjunction with cash flow investing. We want to use it for uh, in ways that where we're creating value in multiple places at the same time, very directly. And in this case, using the cash flow that we create through that investing to funnel that right back into the policy, re- and regenerating what we we basically call it an opportunity fund. We're regener- regenerating the opportunity fund. So we can take a loan and go back out and do it again. And so it creates this, this cycle in conjunction with the investing that people are already doing and will be doing in the future. And we're just making it better. So let me just reiterate what Rod's saying, because I'm, uh, I'm good at dumbing things down and making them easy, I think. So here's the concept that I think was really just the aha moment for me on this was, was okay, so you can put, say you had, and, and by the way, there's not like a, minimum on this per se. This is not a product just for, you know, high net worth individuals, although, you know, the more you can put in this stuff, the better. But um, so the concept was uh, basically, as I understood it was, okay, well, let's see, you could take a hundred thousand dollars 
in a year if you wanted to, uh, and put this in a policy. Within just a few months, uh, the majority of that you could even start to access to loan yourself money to invest somewhere else. Okay, so initially when you hear that, you're like, okay, well, why would you even bother putting it in there if you were just going to borrow it back anyway? Well, here's the concept. So I put the money in and it's growing at say, let's say it's like five and a half percent, right? That's, uh, that's a, uh, you know, fixed, uh, interest plus dividends. Dividends aren't supposed to be guaranteed, but in these companies, generally they've been, you know, they've been distributing these dividends nonstop since the civil war. So it's pretty darn guaranteed. Okay. So I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm going to say that even though it's not, the case, but the way I see it, if something's been every year since the Civil War, through uh, through you know hyperinflation of the '80s, through the uh, through the Great Depression, then to me that's that's a pretty good track record. So okay, making five five and a half percent, whatever on that, and I'm not saying that's going to be for everybody, but now your money's growing at a compounding rate. There now, if you don't know the difference between simple interest and compounding interest, look it up. It's a big difference. So your money's growing there compounding interest. Fantastic. Okay. So now I borrow it, but here's the beauty of this is why it's different from say like a home equity line of credit. So I'm borrowing money and effectively the cash value in my, uh, in my policy is not getting removed from the policy. It's acting as collateral in effect. And I'm borrowing money from the insurance company. Now the insurance company they may even charge me, who knows, maybe the same in, uh, same rate of interest that my money is growing at. But the difference is when they charge me that interest, they're charging me simple interest. And my money continues to stay in my account and it's growing at a compounding interest. Now, the divergence of that is really the huge deal here over a period of time. And so you can take that money that you borrowed and you can invest it into something else. And so now your money's growing at this compounding rate. You're paying back at a simple rate and your money is then invested into something else. And in fact, you've created a return in two places at the same time. That's the magic of this. Am I, did I say anything wrong? Yeah. No, the, everything you said was, <clears throat> was on par and, and so really what it ends up being, when we meet up with a lot of people who are already cash flow investors and they've been doing this, typically what they're doing is they're just flowing that money in and out of a savings account or a money market account, right? They build up the account, they take that money out, they go and invest it, it creates some cash flow, they flow that back into the savings account, it builds back up and they go and do it again, right? In this case, what we're doing is we're just replacing that with with this uh, this specially designed life insurance policy so that we can capture growth, right? You're not getting any growth in the savings account, right? Right. Uh, to begin with. And then, and then the growth that you do capture, it's tax free. And then this difference between simple and compound, this arbitrage that we're able to create, uh, just we're just able to create much more efficiency in the system so that, uh, you know, that cash flow investor doesn't have to feel like, Hey, when my money's sitting on the sidelines, it's just not doing anything for me. Right. Right. I just have these, these just uh, lack of efficiencies in the system. We're, we're just building a process that, that takes care of those. So, so that's, the, I think that's for me was the big aha moment is realizing that this whole double dipping concept this idea of leveraging, because ultimately what we talk about in wealth formula in our, you know, our mathematical form, formula here has always been, you know, wealth is equal to a function of mass, meaning how many, you know, how much money you invest uh, times the product of um, uh, velocity, which is how quickly you get your money back and leverage. And so in effect, what we're doing here is we're using the life insurance um, uh, concept, the product to add additional layers of leverage to our investments. And of course, that results in leverage appreciation. And so uh, if you, I think Rod goes through a few of these examples uh, at wealthformulabanking.com if you look at the webinar. But in effect, 
the uh, the numbers that you can get in terms of increasing your total return on capital is pretty astounding. And all you did was drag it through this policy before investing it. That's all you did, really. And then you created an additional layer of um, you know a benefit for your heirs in the event that you died. So what am I missing here? What, what am I missing? So I think I think you nailed it. In fact, um, we show an example uh, on the webinar where someone just puts in a hundred that when you're, when you're contributing a hundred thousand dollars and every five years they go into a new investment opportunity. Um, and we show the difference being over a 20 year time frame, over a million dollars. So again, when you look at it, you say, okay, like I could just do what I'm doing through my savings account, or I could make this adjustment. I could literally have a million dollars more, but all along the way I've had creditor protection and tax benefits and all these other things that go along with it. So from that standpoint, it's, it's just incredibly valuable and multi-purposed. Yeah. And, you know, there's so many different ways to look at uh, banking, too. And I've sort of evolved in many ways, too, initially looking at it from that, you know, double dipping perspective. And now I, you know, I, I, I look at it as, um, you know, a, a, an ongoing source of liquidity. A lot of real estate investors don't have that. But if you're going to have money sitting somewhere and it's growing in a, you know, a, a creditor protected account tax free, you know, five and a half percent or five percent or whatever it is. Uh, compare that to the bank. I mean, there's just so many uh, additional benefits to it. But let's let's switch gears just a little bit because um, so we were doing this, and um, you know, we uh, I got involved with you guys that helped me really understand this. And obviously, you know, I I drink the Kool Aid on this, folks. I have, you know, I have pol- the policies myself. Um. And, but in, in that process, you know, I started learning more about some of the other products. And one thing that I found was there was something called, um, indexed universal life, which, um, which is an interesting concept. And actually Tony Robbins brings it up very briefly in his, uh, money, money book, you know, learn the game or whatever it was. And then he never explains it. He talks about it. He just kind of just says, what if there was this account where you could take, you know, 10% of the upside of the market and none of the downside? What if there was that? And then he never says anything about it. Well, that's what this is in a nutshell, but then add leverage. So I still is, is sort of crazy to me that this is something that works, but it, it's, Okay, well, why don't why don't one of you explain this concept? Because it's again, it's a little mind boggling when you hear about it for the first time. We call it, yeah, by the so, way, velocity. We call it velocity plus, and it's there's a webinar on this on wealthformulabanking.com as well. Well, so you hit on it, Buck. Uh, most people already are familiar with this with the idea of leverage, and some people have heard about this index universal life thing. I'll hit on that for a second in just a minute. But what I want to just throw out there first is a basic understanding of really what it is. And so um, put simply, it's utilizing leverage to um, dramatically accelerate income at a future, at a future point. So this is a product or this is a, this is a strategy that's going to be more along the lines of a comparison between like traditional retirement account, because it's a longer term um, a longer term product. But what we're doing is we're max maximum funding the index universal life policy, which like you said, will have a capital floor. Basically it's, let's just use the numbers you said, let's say 10% is my cap, zero is my floor. Put simply, if the market goes up 10% or more, I get 10%. The market's down. I just get zero in that year. So like you said, we don't lose money. Um, but in that given year, we may not gain it. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take that underlying vehicle and we're going to add leverage to it, just like we would in if we were purchasing real estate. And we call this concept conservative leverage. So we're going to add this layer where when I put money into Velocity Plus, I might put in, let's just, let's just throw out some example numbers. If I put in $50,000, I would put that $50,000 in for five years. The bank, which is which is going to be the leverage component is going to contribute 
the same 50,000 for those first five years. And then I'm just going to stop as the investor, as the policyholder, I stop. The bank continues to fund that for um, another 10 years. So what's happened is it's a, for every dollar I've put in, they're going to put in about three. Um, and what's really amazing about the concept is that just by creating an arbitrage between interest earned and interest paid with the addition of leverage, we can, we can bring that out and draw huge amounts of income. So I'll just give you a quick income example. So if I was a, let's, let's just say a 40 year old, um, and I started to get into the concept, I could put in $50,000 a year for five years. So a total of 250,000. And then from the ages of 65 to 90, I could take out 150 grand a year tax free for a total of $3.9 million. So I put 250 in, I get 3.9 million out. And that's because we're utilizing the life insurance policy, the time value of money and um, leverage. So this so is a, those three components. This is a, you might wonder like, how do you get those numbers? Those numbers sound kind of downright crazy. Right. And here's let me explain this, because I think, again, the leverage is key as real estate investors um, think about the return that you're getting on the market, whether that's seven, eight percent or, you know, 10 percent in this case was the cap. Although, you know, that's that's different. Right. Sometimes it's higher. Sometimes it's lower. But let's use effectively what that is, is that's our cap rate. Right. That's our cap rate. And, and then, so then we add leverage to it. So if you have three to one leverage and you have 7% gain, and I'm using that as an average of the S and P conservative average of the last couple of decades or whatever per year, that 7% will actually, uh, result because of the leverage in an increase uh, in, in a yield of approximately just under 20% uh, for a given year. So now imagine that is again, now it's compounding too, right? This is compounding. That's why this thing is so dang powerful. And so the question to me that comes to my mind is, well, why wouldn't you, if you have money in the market anyway, and you're counting on the S and P 500, why wouldn't you do it this way instead of just having money in the market? Because here, because you've got the cap and the floor, you've got effectively guardrails, okay? You might be saying, okay, well, I'm giving up some of that if I have a cap at 10. Not really, because if you have a 7% gain at 3 to 1, that's like 20%. How often does the market go up 20% in, in a year? It does, but not very often, right? So you've got a cap and a floor. You go below zero. You're not going to end up losing half your you know, retirement money. And then the cap is really not even so much of a cap because with the intra because of the leverage, you can take a lot of that gain and probably more than the market's going to give you, definitely more than the market's going to give you. Um, so then why would you not want to have exposure to the market with guardrails like that and leverage? To me, it sounds like kind of a little bit of a no brainer, but so, so what are the downsides here? What are we not seeing? I mean, has this been stress tested? I know the answer to this, by the way, but I'm <laughs> tell, tell us, because again, this is one of those things that, I mean, listen, I just think, you know, there are a few of these things where to me, it's like, uh, I mean, why this, this sounds like awfully, you know, maybe a safer way than to just have your money sitting in your typical, you know, brokerage account. So maybe I'll take a quick shot at this and Rod, you can add to, to uh, anything I miss. But um, I think, I think when people learn about it, um, it does become a lot more of a no brainer, especially when you're comparing it to like traditional retirement accounts. And so this is something that has been really fun to see take hold because um, a lot of your listeners have been actively, we've been working with a lot of listeners to help put this into place. And again, really it's about re accelerating retirement, bringing that without, ex okay, so Buck, here's, here's a good way to think of it. You talk a lot about risk adjusted return yep. and I don't have exact risk adjusted return numbers here, but what I can tell you is that when you compare the, when you compare that concept of how much risk I'm taking versus how much return I can get, 
the utilizing velocity plus just far exceeds what you can get in the market. Um, and so you're, you're literally taking less risk and have more upside. So from that st- standpoint, it's really great. Now, what are the barriers? Maybe that's the, the question. I would say there's a couple of things that, that throw people off. One of them is just going back to what we've talked about. It's life insurance, right? We're under, we're utilizing index universal life. And some people just can't get through that, you know, all of the noise from wall street or from the gurus or whatever, suggesting that life insurance can be really valuable, right? It's just, it just, some people can't get through it. Um, and then I think the other thing is that it's something that's just so new. So now it's not just life insurance, but it's also adding leverage as a new concept. But here's our experience. Over time, as people learn about it, it's just continuing to grab hold more and more. And I think that you probably um, find a lot of listeners who really just genuinely feel like it's a no brainer. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, uh, you know, there, this, by the way, is a concept that's um, in and of itself is not, not new because I mentioned earlier um, that I started hearing about some high net worth friends using various insurance products. And one of them, uh, one of, one of the early exposures I had was a, a friend who was involved with, um, with the, I guess the big sister or big brother of, of Velocity Plus, which is where this thing came from, which is a, a more, um, a premium finance IUL that, you know, isn't just three to one, but could potentially even be infinite. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Because we do have people, I mean, you have to have a certain amount of net worth or income to do that, but that's something that, um, as you know, we're, you and I, uh, you guys and me are talking about this year for my, uh, my personal situation. I actually have a ton of what's called convertible term insurance. Um, in other words, it's term, but I can convert it into permanent. So I'm thinking about doing one of these premium finance, you know, high leverage uh, IULs. Um, maybe you guys could talk a little bit about that because and, and who, who, who qualifies, who would potentially qualify for something like that? Yeah, I can, uh, I can jump in on that one. So uh, really what we've been talking about up to this point with Velocity Plus fits in that category of premium finance. Uh, in, in this case, it's uh, almost like an off-the-shelf product that we're plugging into that's already been all worked out. The, the, the banks, it's really a streamlined process for getting people involved with premium finance. And what you're talking Velocity about is... Velocity Plus is. Velocity, Velocity Plus is. Plus is. And, and, yeah. and, and there, is there a minimum sort of income level that you need typically for banks to, to qualify you for that? Yeah, that's so really that one's for anyone who makes over a hundred thousand dollars a year. Yeah. So So most of our, most of our listeners are going to be in that for sure. Yeah. We'll we'll fit in that. So, uh, so now when we, when we expand that and we say, okay, what's the broader picture of premium finance? Well, for people who, who have a net worth, generally it's over about $5 million uh, of your net worth then or if you're making like can, a million bucks a year right and you might be new relatively new you'd be making a million two million bucks a year would you also qualify so yes i mean we can we can work those out with with and so right. again in this case basically what we're doing is we're creating a one-off right rather with with velocity plus it's kind of a pooled concept we're bringing a bunch of different people together for the sake of getting better terms on the loan in this case we're we're putting an individual case together and saying okay we uh, we see the value of using leverage in conjunction with this sort of uh, policy, this index universal life policy. And so we're going to custom build the, the strategy for that individual. In other words, how much money is going into the policy of what's going into the policy, how much of that is leveraged versus how much is going to go in out from out of pocket. And, and basically the, it, it's a it's a blank slate. We get to custom design how we're going to do that. And so, like you said, it could be uh, all the way up to the to the level where you're financing 100% of the money going into that policy. And uh, and the way that you can do that, or the way that we really do any of this, is that we have uh, the ability to use as collateral some other asset in that person's world. Right. So, as an example. Let's say that they have 
uh, a certain amount of money that's sitting in a brokerage account. And it's, the plan is for it to stay there and, and just continue to do its thing, the, the long-term invest strategy, then why not let it do its thing and use it as collateral, leverage it to create this brand new asset. And so again, it's accomplishing both of those aims at the same time. And so that's what makes it the difference, right? That's why we can uh, have a situation where the money's going to the policy and most, if not all of that money is coming through the leverage from the bank. So which is, if you think about it in the way I've thought about this, kind of crazy almost, right? Because what you're effectively talking about is for, you you talk about why people like the rich are getting richer and all that. I mean, look at this concept. Basically what you're saying here is that you are going to take money you already have in the bank, use as collateral, then create a multi-million dollar asset out of thin air. I mean, that's basically what this thing is, yeah. right? Because what you're doing is, yeah. okay, you're saying, okay, I mean, you could you could have a million dollar year uh, premium in theory. Uh, and, and I don't know, I think there might be uh, somebody in the, you know, a couple people in the group are getting close to that. And in theory, a few of them, a few of them, and they they might be putting in a hundred grand a year, maybe maybe not. Um, and in the meantime, they're building this asset that over the course of you know ten fifteen years is worth what? I mean, oh projection. Gosh. I mean, yeah, it could be. You know, when we initially projected out say fifteen years, we're probably talking twenty million dollars of death benefit, maybe four or five million dollars of cash. And when you project it out to a person's life. We're talking about, you know, a hundred million dollars. Um, and again, it's something like you said, can be created just by utilizing an asset. Like we like to call them lazy assets, something that, you know, sit, is like a buy and hold situation. And now, like you said, you can create this map and it's, and it's like you said, the whole rich is getting richer. This is generational wealth. This is how people really take things to the next level. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's sort of, again, mind boggling and a number of you I know qualify for this. Uh, I, again, am um, in the process of converting, you know, term, uh, a convertible term to do this 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 year. Uh, I just think it's, it's something for a lot of you to think about because it's all it's doing is it's taking money that you already have and using it as collateral. And the other thing is that understand that the collateral is not necessarily as much as you would think, right? That's the other thing about it is. So if you have, if you were, you know, if you're doing a million dollar a year, you know, um, you know, zero, you put no money in at all. Uh, what did, did I remember you guys had some projections for me and like sort of yeah. maximum collateral amounts and stuff like that. What was that? Yeah. So, uh, I'll talk about this on a couple of different levels. So on its base level, when we just do our, our reasonable projections on, on assumptions as far as the market and that kind of thing, then your, your total collateral might be about that. So again, if you're doing a million dollars a year for say 10 years, then your maximum collateral might be about say 900,000 or a million. Um, now one thing to clarify is that is the maximum as well. So that might mean, in the first few right. years, it would be significantly less than that, but that would be like the high water mark. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. And, and, and by then, the way, if you put a hundred grand a year in into that, instead of making it, you know, purely a hundred percent bank leverage, all of a sudden that may drop substantially. Yeah. yeah exactly. Right. So, um, and then, like you said earlier, you know, we do these stress tests. We want to make sure that we know. Not just not just what's a reasonable projection uh, and what to expect in terms of how the account grows and how much income it creates down the road or how much death benefit creates for for this estate planning thing, but but if we were to have a Great Depression, for example, uh, not just a year or, or a couple of years like we would, might normally see with with what you might think of as as you know typical market volatility, but but you know again a Great Depression five years in a row, nine out of twelve years then we're going to stress test that and make sure that we understand how that, how that impacts the strategy. And then on the, on the flip side, because interest rates matter on the loan side, then we're going to do stress testing against the uh, 1980s 
when interest rates were quite high for a long period of time so that we can understand how does the how does our strategy hold up in that scenario. So again, we don't just throw out the rosy numbers and, and just say, hey, we hope this is what it's going to be. But we all are on the same page when we when we talk through this to say, okay, uh, this is actually probably realistic on what it's going to be. But let's also look at, at you know, kind of worst case and from a historical standpoint, what that would look like as well. Uh, just just to clarify too, with with Velocity Plus, which is the sort of in a in a box um, program, there's no required collateral either, which is also kind of nice. Um, yeah. The let's let's um one thing that people get sort of confused on, and I think it's useful to uh, address is we keep talking about you know the listen if you haven't figured it out by now these policies these these um you know, these strategies that we're using, as much as they are actually technically life insurance, we're really talking about creating wealth for you and in your life, right? So, um, so say you do, you know, Velocity Plus or, or you do, you know, some premium finance thing and if you accumulated a bunch of cash, you've got several million dollars, 10, 15 years down the road of cash value and you wanna you wanna use it to retire. So how is how is how does one get the money out, and why is it tax free, and how does that all work? Yeah. So uh, to begin with, so how does how does one get the money out? Um, a little bit ago, we talked about in wealth forming the banking, we use this this idea of a loan against the cash value, right? In premium finance, we do the same thing. Again, we want to maximize our use of leverage. So when it comes time to take income, we're not actually removing any cash out of your account. We're going to take a policy loan against the cash value and and that becomes your income. And someone might be saying, Rob, that sounds crazy. What I'm taking a loan in, in retirement and that's my income. And, and uh, the idea is that because your cash in your account stays there and continues to compound, even while you've taken the loan against it, then uh, we're, we've created uh, uh, the arbitrage again, right? So I have, on average, in these IUL products, um, I'm going to be earning more on the compounding growth side than I will in my loan interest accumulation side. Right. Right. So to begin with, and then number two is I always have a much higher value in my cash value than I have on my loan balance. And so over time we actually end up outpacing the growth, outpacing any kind of accumulation in your loan on your loan balance side with the growth that we're seeing in the, in the cash value side. So what does that mean? Right. At the end of the day, if you're familiar with the traditional world of, of retirement income, if you built up say, you know, an account in a brokerage, uh, or, or a, an IRA type of thing, and you pro- approach your broker and he says, oh, yeah, you can take 4%, right? Beck, I, I know you've spent time on the show talking about the 4% rule yeah, yeah, yeah. and how just silly it is it's at, at its face, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah at, but even given that, let's just take 4%, right? Even though there are a lot of brokers that wouldn't even give you that much. Uh, so let's say you've, you've accumulated you know, a couple million dollars inside of that account and they're saying, okay, you can take $80,000 a year on that. Right. In this case, inside of a, a premium financed policy, let's say you have the same uh, net difference of $2 million between what you've accumulated on your cash value versus what you have on your loan. Okay. So you have a net difference of $2 million. Well, we're not going to say 4%. Okay. When, when you run the numbers and because of this, this arbitrage that we're creating, it actually becomes more like 10 to 15%. And so for the same $2 million, we can uh, multiply that income by three or four times what the the traditional world is doing. And so, uh, like Christian said earlier, we often use the word accelerate. We can just accelerate that income to a level that you just can't reach when you don't use the same principles of leverage and the things that we're, we're able to use inside of the strategy. Um, so bottom line is, folks, this is what it means is you're taking loans that you never have to pay back. <laughs> <laughs> that's really what it is. That's and right. so that's the why benefit pays and, it back. Right. Well, the death benefit pays it back. Yeah. And, so we don't pay it back. Right. But your death benefit is substantially higher than, you know, the income that yeah. you're going to take out of there. 
So you're going to, it's going to get paid back. And that's why when you are living on the loan, you don't, you, you never get taxed on a loan. Uh, right. I mean, so Mm -hmm. that that's basically why it's tax-free income. So, um, last question. Okay. You know, we've been doing this, you guys have been doing this for a while. Lots of clients, we got a lot of the high net worth people. Um, you know, we've got some big hitters in, in our group too. Right. Um, talk about some of the additional creative stuff, um, that they might be doing that might be of interest to some people. So I have a couple of thoughts on that. Um, with some, of th- there's been a few different concepts and different situations that make sense. So one of the challenges that people have is they have, uh, and especially this happens in our group, we have people who, um, accumulate a lot of money in say retirement accounts, and then they kind of become, um, more comfortable, let's say with the alternative investing space. And now they're kind of saying, okay, well, what do, what do I do with this? Right. Uh, so one strategy that we've been, that we've been teaching people is a way to help, um, in an incredibly tax efficient way, bring money out of the, um, out of IRAs so that it can be utilized in, you know, a variety of other ways. And there's some really cool things that we do with it. I, I don't know that it will be super helpful to get into it, but if you're someone that has a bunch of IRA money and you're thinking, well, what do I need? What, what am I going to do with this? Um, that's a conversation we can definitely have. One of the other things that we focus on is for certain situations, we'll help people with more, uh, when they're in their peak earning years, look for tax deductions. Um, for example, we talk, we've talked a lot about utilizing captive insurance in conjunction with premium finance. Mm-hmm. Um, and we can extend that further to things like defined benefit plans and cash balance plans and things like that. So there's really a variety of options and things. At the end of the day, what we're, what we want to do is help your, um, high income, uh, listeners, you know, become high net worth. And these products, as you can tell are all, and strategies are all really designed to do exactly that. Yeah. Good stuff, guys. I mean, listen, I um I am a massive believer in this stuff, as you know. Uh, you know, I drink the Kool Aid. I'm doing the stuff. You know, I believe in it, and um, you know, and and one one thing that we uh, actually have did not really address in this, which is sort of the I- irony of it all, is to me that the insurance element of this, the life insurance, as I am, you know, just celebrated a, another birthday. Um, in, into my uh, mid to late forties now, I guess, uh, is that you know eventually you're going to die, <laughs> whether you like to think about that or not. And even though that this product is has so many real value propositions for wealth creation while you're living, it also has one additional benefit that uh, to me is great, which is if you screw all of your other investments up. Uh, and you die, at least this one's going to pay out and you won't leave your uh, family high and dry. Um, but Amen. Uh, <laughs> that's right. Um, so think about that. I think it's uh, absolutely something that people should be uh, considering. You know, the higher net worth you are, uh, you know, the more you should be looking at these products and these different paradigms. If you're a business owner, uh, if you are an independent contractor, there's just so many things that's available to you. We're just really skimming the surface here. Um, you know, we'll do webinars again and and try to get uh, some more examples in place. But it, a lot of people have been asking about, you know, what is this wealth formula banking? And so here it is. This is it, Velocity Plus, et cetera. And so if you are interested in uh, looking at, uh, you know, some of these concepts in more detail, first uh, go to wealthformulabanking.com. There's some really good webinars there. And that's also uh, where you uh, can contact Christian and Rod if you want to, you know, you want to learn a little bit more, you want to run some illustrations with them, explore some ideas, um, and uh, and and pretty much these guys are the best in the business when it comes to this, and that's why that's why I work with them. So Christian, Rod, thanks again for being on Wealth Formula Podcast. Thanks, Mike. Our pleasure. Thanks for having us. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the show, everyone. Hopefully that gives you a taste for, you know, what the whole 
deal with this these concepts really is. And again, they're concepts, they're tools, there are ways to enhance your wealth. Of course, they can be viewed as simply assets as well, but that's a very simple way of doing it. And, uh, you know, and, and I just don't think that that really fully takes advantage of all that these types of uh, these policies offer. So I highly recommend that you, A, go to wellformulabanking.com, watch the webinars to get a better sense of how all this works, and B, get in touch with Rod or Christian or both of them uh, to figure out if this is something that will benefit you. The other thing I should point out is there are so many other things that, you know, especially in the high net worth space, if you're, you know, a $5 million plus person, or you say you're making a million, $2 million a year or whatever, there's so much crazy, crazy stuff uh, that you could be doing uh, that you're going to want to figure out. I would definitely touch base with Rod and Christian um, and don't get left out. Don't be one of those people who has all this stuff and uh, all this money and, and continues to invest as if they're part of the, you know, lower or middle class. That's it for me this week on Wealth Formula Podcast. This is Buck Joffrey signing off. Thank you for listening to the Wealth Formula Podcast. Visit us on the web at wealthformula.com. The information contained in this podcast are opinions, not fact. As always, consult your own financial team before making any investment. See you next time.